All right, good morning. It's good to see you. We are continuing our series, This Changes Everything. And um, I'd like to end the series with this message today. I've entitled it simply A New Future. Um, we put things together as we've gone through the last, the last five weeks, really talking about the resurrection beginning on Easter Sunday. And uh, I, I just want to kind of put it together as we think about it and apply our, to our lives today. To be honest, most of us, we just stop and think about it, most of us don't really think and talk as much about Christ's resurrection and our own impending resurrection as, as we probably think we do. We just, I want you to just think that for a moment. We believe it. I doubt there's anyone here who doesn't believe in the resurrection. If you don't, I hope you listen carefully and, and take God at his claims. But we just don't talk about or preach about that much. Be, be very honest, I don't bring a great deal of messages just about the resurrection and our resurrection. Now, Easter, we do that. We'll talk about heaven in general terms throughout, um, throughout our daily lives. Um, and there may be different things that might bring it up. It may be, as long as we're healthy and our family's healthy, then we don't dwell on it very much. As I said, we focus on it at Easter, and if we're at a funeral of a believer, we'll talk about heaven and God's promises there. But we don't bring it up so much in our day-to-day -day conversations. Unless you're talking to a saint of God, someone who knows that their time is very limited on this earth, and many times as they are lying in the bed there knowing that they may not have another day, then you have more of a conversation about it. Get the idea I'm talking about. In fact, sometimes we tend to shrink the gospel uh, to just this life, the here and now. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important. It definitely is applicable to this daily life. But we tend to focus on the things that God's doing now. And it makes sense because that's where we are. We're in the now, the present. We think of how God's changing us, maybe how he's changing our relationships. We think about how God's providing our needs. And those are the things we're focused on, really, more than probably eternity. We think of the fact that he's forgiven us of our sins, and we're talking about the difference that has made in our life. And really, the messages we've been looking at have been along that line, and that's, that's totally right, and it's the way it should be. We focus on what God has already brought into existence through Christ, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is a very important part of our approach uh, to what the Bible says. The Christian life brings practical solutions to the problems we face in this life. That's one thing that you should hear when you come to, to hear a message and understand it's not just for the sweet by and by, a pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. There's more to it than that. There is something on this side. God's word gives us guidance. It gives us wisdom that we need to navigate the tough seas of life. It's there for us. It is, as it claims to be, as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Shows us the way we should be going. Helps us make the decisions we ought to make. It is important to hear from God about how we should deal with our finances, how we should deal with relationships with others and our family, between husbands and wives, uh, parents and children, all just in all those areas. The Bible speaks to those things. In reality, God addresses everything we're going to face in this life, if we're only open to his instruction about it. However, when we only think about the now, we miss out on the best parts of salvation. Because that's not all there is to it. We're forgetting the best parts about being a Christian are yet to come. And you think about it for a moment. Uh, it is, and I remember growing up, I used to sing a chorus. It's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. It's a wonderful thing to be saved. It's a wonderful thing to know Jesus and to possess the life he gave. I totally believe that with all my heart. I really would rather be a Christian and, uh, and this life than anything else. And it, it is it's just an amazing thing that we can experience. But that's not, that's not the best part of the Christian life. It's not the best part of what we're going to experience because we're still living in a messed up world and a broken world. It's, it's kind of like this. When we focus only on what we're living in right now and we forget the future, it's kind of like an engagement before marriage. Now, engagements... That engagement period can be exciting. I mean, when uh, the guy pops the question and the ring is placed on the finger and the, the young lady has a tendency to be able to flash that, you know, that 
ring around wherever she goes, and there's this excitement, and they begin to make their plans, and, and uh, sometimes there might be some frustrations, but there's, there's this excitement. There's an excitement in preparing for a wedding. But it's all pointing towards the day you're actually going to take your wedding vows. You're actually going to be husband and wife. So you're, the, you know this is preceding that. And you can enjoy, you should enjoy the engagement time. And it's wonderful, and there's a great celebrations even there, leading up to the actual wedding. But can you imagine someone says, you know what, we like in this engagement thing so much, we decided we're not going to get married, we're just going to continue as engaged, you know, never really come together as husband and a wife, but, but we like this engagement time, it's fun. And you know it is, you get to talk about your future and you plan your life together, but it's just the means to the end. The engagement is meant to lead you to marriage. And it's in the same way, this life is meant to get us ready for eternity. And there's some things, and obviously, that we enjoy God working in our lives in this, on this side of heaven. And we see how God provides needs. And maybe you've been able to share how God has brought healing, or maybe how God has provided something in a financial way, or maybe God's... Uh, uh, healed a, a marriage and, and that we can give God honor and glory and that's exciting. Just think as exciting as that is, it's, it's not even really the beginning of what heaven will be like. That's an amazing thing. This life is just the preparatory time. And when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you pass from death into life. We've been talking about that. You've been saved. Your sins have been forgiven past, present, and future. You're never going to, they're never going to be held against you. Your salvation, though, is just starting. It's going to continue throughout eternity. It's just starting at that point. It's only like a dressing room. The best is yet to come. Someone wrote the hymn, Blessed Assurance. One line says this, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. They understood it. They got the idea. This, this experience of Christ in our life and this assurance we can have as believers, boy, that's just a tiny taste of what eternity will be. The reality of the resurrection not only gives us hope in this life, it really does. There is no hope without the resurrection, but it provides the only hope we could ever have for all eternity. I want to focus on that today, and I want to challenge you to make that focus. Now, you're listening to me here, or those who are on Facebook, please Please think about this. Open your hearts up to this today. I'd like to begin with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. I hope you have your Bibles with you or have access to the Bible. You can watch this. They are, the verses are projected up here, but I, I encourage you to, to get in this and think about the words of the Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again, because... God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the focus of it, right? Now we live with great expectation. It's important to understand what he's talking about. Yeah, there's, he's not, Peter's not just in reference to what he's going to experience in life. In fact, if you have an idea what the first century Christians, the apostles specifically, what they had in front of them, he's talking about great expectation. The guy's going to be, going to be crucified upside down. What a great expectation. You, you know, and as far as in this life, he wasn't going to be treated very well. He's going to go through quite a bit of persecution and eventually die as a martyr. And yet he's looking at, of course, even that in a sense of expectation of being able to, uh, to die for the cause of Christ. But beyond that, he's looking at eternity. The resurrection is the basis for that hope. I want to talk about the great expectation today. Let me just give you something, and we've been mentioning this, that first of all, it's, it's important to start with this, that the resurrection is absolutely essential. Now, I don't have to, I don't have to ex convince you of that today. I'm pretty sure most of you would agree with me. The resurrection is absolutely essential. I'm going to go back to the verse we started with when we began this series, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to reread some of those verses, add some of the others in there. But look at this statement, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, begin with verse number 3. Paul saying, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. So this is a very vital, very important thing he's talking about here. Here's what it is. Here's the gospel, by the way. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. 
After that, he is seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. In other words, Paul is saying this is written in the first century. When he writes this, many of the people who were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection were still alive. And he's saying, in essence, okay, if you have a question about what I'm saying, whether it's true or not, uh, let me give you some names and addresses. You can maybe email these folks or something and get their testimony on it. They're still alive. They can still tell you that they saw it. So he, he is verifying the uh, actual, the, the credibility of the resurrection. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Paul, Paul is writing a letter. Now here's something we need to think about. He's writing a letter to a very dysfunctional church, church in Corinth. You might not think of it that way. If you go through First and Second Corinthians, the people in Corinth had some struggles. They, were, they had come from a background that was just about as opposite as you could get from biblical standards, and they were still affected by those things. They, they were struggling with some of those areas. There were some serious divisions among the church, the church people concerning the leadership. Some were saying, we, we, we like Apollos best, and some were saying, no, we like Paul. And some said, hey, we're really super spiritual. We're the followers of Jesus. And Paul's saying, you guys, just there's no divisions in Christ. Knock it off. And so he deals with that. Uh, they had, uh, there are many in the church who were struggling. And there's one particular situation. They're struggling with the idea of sexual sin. And Paul deals with that. They had some marriage problems. They had, some of them struggled with the idea of idolatry. That's just naming a few of the problems they were facing. And 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with those things. But at the very end of this book, we're now at the end in chapter 15, or almost at the end of the book, Paul focuses on the resurrection. The fact that Jesus died and rose from the grave. And he goes in great detail about the resurrection because he wanted them to know that this wasn't just a spiritual resurrection. It was, we'd call a bodily or a physical resurrection. The physical body of Jesus was no longer in the tomb. It had been resurrected. It had been changed into a glorified body. And hundreds of people had seen that. And they knew that Jesus was alive. And now he reigns over everything in his resurrected physical body. So that is the point he's making of the resurrection. It's important because if Jesus' resurrection didn't happen, we're still in our sins and we have never been forgiven. That's the point he makes as he goes through this. That's why the resurrection is such an essential doctrine. He states this down in the next few verses in verses 15 to, or I'm sorry, 17 to 19. We're still in 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. So you're still in your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more pit to be pitied than anyone in the world. Christianity is not based just on this life. It's not just about this life. It's not just, well, you live as a Christian, you have a better life, but that's it. That's all you get out of it. That's not what it's about. Yes, it does affect this life. Yes, it makes a difference in the way we live, but that's not what it's all about. It goes so far beyond that. And that's the point he's making. Jesus is rising from the dead. absolutely essential to us being forgiven by God. Couldn't happen without it. If Jesus had just died but didn't rise, it would mean he didn't conquer the curse of sin and death. The resurrection is a sign that he indeed did pay for our sin. All right, the evidence is there. His death accomplished our salvation. But his resurrection is like there's a beacon to the cosmos. And this beacon is saying, he won. He did. He won. He's the victor over death, sin, and the grave. Death could not hold him. And through the resurrection, we know the curse has been lifted for those who trust in him. And one day, death will be no more. That's what we find when we go and look at the resurrection. It's an amazing thing. However, that's not the end of the resurrection message. We've been studying the last two weeks. Christ's resurrection means every believer has been resurrected in him. Now, we, we understand now that we, at this point in, in our experience, we will experience one day, unless the Lord comes back in our lifetime, we will experience physical death. But we also know that we have been granted and we have been guaranteed a physical resurrection. When they say the last goodbyes, when you say your last goodbyes, when they, they put us into the coffin and they lower us into the ground, that's just temporary because one day that body's going to be resurrected. That's the promise that God's given to us. 
we understand we will experience a physical resurrection. So the resurrection is absolutely essential in understanding Christian doctrine. Whenever someone begins to try to tone down the idea of a resurrection, try to question whether it's actually a physical resurrection, as some cults do. They try to tell you that Jesus is resurrected spiritually. That doesn't even make sense. But anyway, that's the basic teaching of several cults. He's resurrected spiritually. No, he, didn't die. he didn't die spiritually. He's resurrected bodily in a physical form. It's a glorified body, but he's resurrected just as we will be one day. Here's the next thing. This is a reminder. Believers share then in Christ's resurrection. Let me go on down. Begin with verse number 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. All right? It has taken place. So in, by, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everything or everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. It's like in the Old Testament days when the covenant God had made with Israel, they had the feast of the first fruits, and which when that harvest, the very beginning of it, it uh, they would bring that as a special offering to God. It was indicating that there would be a harvest to follow. So Christ is the first fruits. His resurrection, his actual physical resurrection is the first fruits, is the reminder to us, the guarantee to us that one day we will be physically resurrected. Vital and important to understand that. The resurrection of Christ is the ultimate hope of the gospel. And what we're getting here in this life, we see, I guess you can call it snapshots of what God's kingdom is going to be like. We're, we're experiencing that, but it's still somewhat limited. Let me just give some for instances. There are many whose marriages, for instance, have been reconciled because the idea of coming to Christ and God has restored that, and so his power has been manifested. Lives have been restored. There have been those who have been caught up in well, the addictions, or whatever it might be, and they have, they have been restored and brought back to be able to live a uh, life that's worth living because of the, rest, the restoration of the gospel message. So we can see these types of things happening. But the problem is, we still live in a broken world. We still live in a messed up world. And even as believers, we can still sin, and we can still and often will be affected by other sins. And as believers, though, we can still experience and we're often going to observe wonderful works of God. But they are only glimpses into what's to come in the future. Paul says it this way in chapter 2, verse number 9, 1 Corinthians. He says, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We just couldn't comprehend it. We just can't get it, how great and how awesome it's going to be. And on the day of the resurrection, we will finally see the kingdom of God in its fullness. Yeah, it's important that we understand how God works and answers prayer. And, and I will not, and, and not trying to minimize those things at all. Those are things we can expect and we can see in our lives. But I'm telling you, the very best and most exciting time you've ever had in Christ in this life. And you can stop for a moment and think about maybe it was the day you got saved you're thinking of. Maybe it's how God answered the prayer, a very specific prayer. Or maybe you're thinking of several things that God has done. And you can say, God's so awesome and he's so great. And I'm telling you, that is nothing compared to eternity. You're just getting a tiny, tiny taste of what it's going to be like. That's what we need to grasp and understand. One day, the resurrection, of the resurrection, we're going to finally see the kingdom of God in its fullness. The whole universe is going to be remade to display His glory in ways it can't right now because it's been tainted by sin. We'll receive bodies with no more sin, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow. Right now, the people of God, hey, we're God's legally adopted kids. God's gone through the whole process. He's legally adopted us. But we're still in a distant country waiting to go home. See, that's where we are right now. And we can rejoice in that. And we can and we should. 
I'm a child of the King, joined heirs with Jesus. I'm, and we can be rejoicing in those things, but they're just a tiny idea of what heaven's going to be like. One day we get to go home and we will be given that glorified body. In the resurrection moment, we'll finally come home to our Father and we'll enjoy every right of being His children to the extreme end. All of the greatest blessings are yet to come. Let me take you to this then. The reality of the resurrection will make us more effective in this life for the cause of Christ. I really believe that. I think one of the, one of the reasons we sometimes struggle and, and um, do not really focus on the great things God has done for us is because we get focused on trying to make it through this life. And we take our eyes off what God has for us. And if we're not careful, we might buy into the idea that you can think too much about the life to come. You'll neglect, by doing that, you'll neglect opportunities in this life. I'm going to say this. That is simply not true. And let me explain what I'm saying. I know that there are people who might talk a lot about heaven, and maybe they talk a lot about hell, and they, they have a pretense of, of being these super Christians, but they, they really are not doing anything to serve other people. Yeah, there's always someone like that around. But that's not characteristic of those who are truly focused on eternity. That's just someone in a backslidden state or whatever. That's not someone who's truly focused on eternity. I'm going to say this. There is no one in this life that's genuinely thinking, genuinely thinking about God's coming kingdom and their own resurrection that isn't actively serving others in this life. We become ap apathetic in our service Precisely because we are not thinking about the resurrection and eternal life. And we're focused on this life to the point that we're not really concerned about the next. And we get our eyes focused on the things and the problems that we might be facing. And we, we simply focus on those and forget what the end is going to be. And we miss that great blessing. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32, the last part of that verse says this. If there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. Now that's what it would lead us to. You say, well, I, I believe in the resurrection. But sometimes we don't live like we believe it. If there's no resurrection, then we should get as much out of this life as we can. Because that's we just get you know, one time around here. But the truth is there is a resurrection. A life that's lived, that's focused only on this life is going to be meaningless. I don't care what you accomplish. You can be the, the best known or the most wealthy person in the world. And if your life is only focused on this life, your life was a waste. You missed it. It's meaningless. But when we dwell on the reality of the resurrection, we will be challenged, if it's necessary even, to lay down our lives for the gospel's sake. We'll be willing and we will experience life to its fullness. A resurrection-focused life is willing to sacrifice the time, the talent, and our money, whatever it takes to promote the kingdom of God. We will understand, listen, this is what it's really all about. And therefore, I'm willing. You think of the, of the apostles, for instance. We know that all, all of them died martyrs' death, except John, as far as we can find out. Only one of their deaths is recorded in the Scripture, and that's James uh, the brother of John, we know that he was beheaded by Herod. The others, we have some pretty good traditions on how that they died. John, it appears, they tried to put him to death a couple, two or three times, but nothing took until it was God's time, and he died a natural death, probably over 100 years old. But of the apostles, we find Peter was, most likely tradition says, he's crucified upside down. His brother Andrew was crucified on a cross. It was in an X form, hence it's called St. Andrew's cross. Some of them were actually skinned alive as in their torture as they put them to death. Uh, some were burned to death. They're just all these different horrendous ways in which they died. They willingly gave their lives, not because they were some type of superhuman. They gave their lives like that because they totally believed and they were, to they were focused on that coming resurrection. And that has been the case of not only the apostles, but men and women throughout the ages. And even today, giving their lives, 
some as martyrs, but others just giving their lives to live for God, willing to maybe put up with some stuff, put up with persecution, whatever it might be, because they understand there's something greater than this life. They're willing to do that. And I'm saying today that Jesus calls us into a lifestyle that doesn't make sense without the reality of the resurrection. Jesus calls us to a lifestyle that says we should be willing to give up whatever is necessary to promote the kingdom of God. That doesn't make sense if heaven's not real and if we will not receive a glorified body one day. But we will. That's the promise. That's what we need to focus on. I am convinced that living in the light of the resurrection changes everything the way we live. I'm going to ask every one of us this question. Are you living in the light of the resurrection? Are you living with that, with that focus? Now, if you're not a believer, if you never put your faith and trust in Christ, obviously you're not living in light of the resurrection because you're, you're simply ignoring the greatest, by the way, the greatest proven fact of history. Go on ignoring it to your own uh, apparel, but you're basically ignoring a wonderful, wonderful truth. And I'm telling you that Jesus died for you. He's given you plenty of reasons to believe that it's true. He's left many witnesses to talk about it and everything else. But you have to make a choice what you're going to do with it. So obviously, if you're not a child of God, you're not living in the light of the resurrection. I challenge you today to think seriously about the fact that Jesus died for your sins, but he didn't remain dead. They put him in a grave, but the grave couldn't hold him. They could put a million stones in front of that tomb, and he still would have walked away. Because he was God in human flesh. And he was resurrected. So Jesus is alive. In a physical body. Now it's glorified. So it's not limited as our physical bodies. But there's no bones of Jesus anywhere. You got that? I mean Jesus was resurrected. By the way the only one of, of founders of religion that can make that claim. Jesus is alive. And that makes all the difference in the world. The resurrection changes the way we look at things. Ask yourself the question, am I living a life that only makes sense in the light of the resurrection? If you're living that way, there are going to be some people who say, why in the world do you do that? Why do you, why do you witness to people? You know, why do you tell people about that? They laugh at you, don't you know that? Why are you willing to, to give of yourself the way you do? What do you get out of that? What's the big deal? If you're living a life if you really believe in the resurrection, it's going to cause you to do things that won't make sense if there was no resurrection. Ask yourself this question. Am I living a life that would make no sense if the dead weren't being raised? I'm focused on those things. If what I believe is not true, then this is a dumb thing to do. And that is, that is what we're looking at. A faith in what God has promised us. Is my schedule? Are my relationships? Is my bank account? Is everything in this life I have and all that I'm living for, is it of such a quality that it doesn't make sense if there's no resurrection? Someone looks at how you spend your time, they go, why in the world do you do that? Why do you spend so much time doing things for God? Because of a resurrection. You know, what is your, what is your checkbook look like that? Why would you, why would you do that? Because of a resurrection. There's no other reason for that. Is, are we living our life that way? Why do, you, why do you do the things you do? That doesn't make sense. No, it's not supposed to. If there were no resurrection. But it makes perfect sense when we believe what Jesus has said and the fact of what he has done. Talk about the resurrection changing everything. It really does. Now, let me finish it off with this statement. It's the last part of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse number 51. Here's a reference to the resurrection. Listen carefully to this statement. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. If the Lord returns before you and I actually come to the portals of physical death. We will not die physically, but our bodies will be transformed, be changed into a glorified body at that point. 
All those who have died, I don't care what they've done to their bodies. I don't care where their bodies have been buried or where the ashes have been, have been scattered. God's going to resurrect them. And there's nothing too hard for God, right? So that's what the statement is. Paul says, I want to give you, I want to reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will be all transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. This is the trumpet that believers are in anticipation that taking place signaling the resurrection of the believers. And the next verse, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forevermore or forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. You see, Paul wrote this almost 2,000 years ago. Are you catching on to what he thought as he's writing this? He was anticipating himself getting to hear the trumpet. Now, he eventually is going to be martyred. They're going to cut his head off and they'll throw that body in the grave. One day that body's going to be resurrected. But Paul was in this anticipation. He believed, and if Paul believes that almost 2,000 years ago, do you think that we should... Be living in an anticipation as well? I think so. But here's the point. When that takes place, we're going to be transformed. And we are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. That's the promise. Jesus was resurrected. We will be resurrected. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Wow. There's the ultimate victory that we experience because of the resurrection. For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. What did Christ do? He died for us, was buried, and he rose again. As we will be resurrected one day. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Here's what I want you to understand. Someone says, well, man, if you focus on the resurrection... And if you focus on eternal life, you're focusing on heaven, you talk about heaven, you sing about heaven, well, you, you know, you're kind of ignoring this life. And I'm saying, no, you're not. What you're doing, you're being better prepared to live this life. There's nothing wrong with anticipating heaven. Oh, yes, God is the one who can take care of the problems we're facing. As talking about for the here and now, there's nothing better than the grace of God working through our lives. But there's something so much better. Don't ever forget that. And Paul is saying, listen, when you focus on that, you're going to be strong and immovable. When the trials come your way, you see, life doesn't always work the way we would like for it to work. Some of you might be experiencing tremendous trials and problems and things right now because we live in a broken world. And you might be trying to do your best and things are still going wrong. And I tell you, don't get discouraged because... The best is yet to come. God's got it. And he's already won. Mark it down. So be strong and immovable. The next statement, always work enthusiastically for the Lord. That's how we ought to be serving God. That's why I'm convinced the more we are really focusing on what the fact of what's taking place in eternity. Let me tell you a couple of things it does. Because I believe in a resurrection I believe in the resurrection of God's toes for his people, those who are his followers, a resurrection to eternal life. But if you continue on, there's also those who have rejected Christ. And I know that they will face an eternity and a place called hell. And that gives me such a burning desire in my heart to warn as many people as I can. And I think I do the same for you. You see, my belief in the resurrection affects the way I think of those who are without Christ. My belief in the resurrection gives me hope when things are going, uh, going bad in my life or I'm seeing others that are going through suffering. When I have to stand by the graveside of those who have passed from this life, there's no hope outside of that. But because of a resurrection, I can tell mothers and fathers or children, and I can tell those who are standing around, listen, there is hope because of what Jesus has done. You see, it changes everything. The resurrection 
always work enthusiastically for the Lord. The reason we do not work enthusiastically for the Lord is because we get our eyes off of God's promises and we're focusing only on this life. Lift up your eyes and see what it's really all about. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Wow. Nothing you ever do for the Lord is ever useless. You say, well, no one noticed it. No, no one saw what I did. I sacrificially did this and no one, hey, yes, somebody saw it. <laughs> Don't ever forget it. God's the one who's keeping the records. He's the one who saw that. No one really cares. No one really appreciates what I've done. Oh, yes, God does. You see, it's this life on this side. We try our best. In fact, even tonight, we're going to have a time. We're trying to show appreciation to all the volunteers. And Sean will be talking about that in a moment. Yeah, we, and we try to tell others, you know, I appreciate the work that you did and that, all those things. But sometimes we don't do it as well as we should, obviously. The truth is, God is taking, God is in charge. And this side is nothing compared to eternity. Nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. It is worth it if we have to give our life for the cause of Christ. If we have to go through life with all types of burdens and problems, if that's the case that we're facing, and that's, I mean, that's an extreme example, but no matter what we might experience in this life, it is not worthless. It is worth it to serve the Lord because the resurrection is real. Don't lose focus. Ask yourself the question, am I living in the light of a resurrection? I trust and pray that you will. Father, asking for your blessing upon this time, may you be honored and glorified. I'm praying that if there's one who's not yet made that decision to follow you, I know they can ignore the things that I say, and maybe whether there's someone here in the audience or someone listening to me on Facebook, they've never made that decision to put their faith and trust in you. Lord, I pray that they'd look seriously at their life and at the claims of Scripture. You've told us that we're all sinners. We're all in, included in that, and the wages of sin is death. But you've also told us that you have offered us a gift, the gift of eternal life. It's through Jesus Christ, and that's why you sent your Son to die for us. And I pray that there are those, if there are those who are hearing these words now, they never put their faith in you, that this would be the day. They'd cry out to you for forgiveness of sin putting their faith in you. But Lord, I pray for every believer today, it is easy to get our focus messed up. It is easy to focus on the problems that we're facing because they're real and they're things that affect us. But Lord, help us to have the ultimate focus on eternity and to just experience that change you will make in our lives when we do that. We want to praise you Thank you for these things, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So um, there's two things in your eye here today. There's two things I want you to know about. Uh, first of all, we, this is the last week. We're looking for volunteers for our lawn care, lawn ministry. Um, I got to think of a really cool, fancy name for it, Frank. Uh, something like, well, I'll think of something cool. But anyways, there's a sign-up sheet for that. It's, it's finally beautiful outside. And Frank, every Saturday now, I see Frank and his lawnmower going by the camera. So Frank needs help. So if you've got anybody in, interested in, in being part of that, um, or if you just want more information about how, how often you have to do it or what it actually details, or just want to see all the cool equipment you get to use, talk to Frank, and he will definitely hook you up and talk to you about that. Uh, also, as you're leaving this morning, if you received an invitation, we're doing a volunteer event tonight. It's not here at the church. It's at the Foundry, which is 42 uh, Front Street. And Port Jervis, there's a, an event going on tonight in collaboration with Restoration Church. Pastor Staff texted me this morning, asked me, just make the final announcement. If you received an invitation, you have an RSVP for that, you can still come. There are a few spots left, but um, we definitely need to know. So speak to myself or Pastor as you're leaving today. Um, Kat, just let us know whether you're going to be there or not so we can get a final head count uh, for the event tonight. It's going to be really, uh, really tremendous. And it's, it's, a, it's a thank you to all our volunteers um, for being part of our, <clears throat> our ministries here and at Restoration Church as well. So definitely speak to myself or pastor as you leave in today. Let us know. With that, everybody, have a great, great day. We'll see you next Sunday.